delighted today to be speaking with Dr. Peter J. Lightheart, President of Theopolis Institute in Birmingham, Alabama, and Senior Fellow of Theology and Literature at New St. Andrews College. Dr. Lightheart has written many, many books, including Defending Constantine, The Twilight of an Empire and the Dawn of Christendom, and Against Christianity. Dr. Lightheart is also the author of the book that we'll be discussing today, The End of Protestantism, Pursuing Unity in a Fragmented Church. Dr. Lightheart, it's our honor to be speaking with you today. Thanks very much, Jonathan. It's great to be here. Dr. Lightheart, you've been active in a number of ecumenical venues, including Evangelicals and Catholics Together, and also the magazine First Things. How did you come to be interested in ecumenical dialogue? Well, I think the main thing that happened was uh, came out of my doctoral studies. I, I did a, a PhD on baptism, and as part of that PhD work, I spent a lot of time studying the book of Galatians, the couple middle couple of chapters of Galatians and the baptismal passage there. And I was trying to put that discussion of baptism in the context of Paul's concerns within Galatians and was particularly struck. I, I have very vivid memory of being in the reading room at the Cambridge University Library and uh, suddenly the, the weight of Galatians 2, uh, I, I felt the weight of Galatians 2 and Paul's rebuke to Peter. Uh, Paul charges Peter with uh, not being straightforward about the gospel. He says that Peter has basically abandoned justification by faith. And the particular thing that Peter's done to warrant this rebuke is that he withdrew from table fellowship with Gentiles. Uh, and from that, uh, that recognition that, that uh, the issue was the unity between Jews and Gentiles in the church, and Paul saw that as a an essential element of the gospel. From that, it, it, be, it began to dawn on me that that's uh, something that Paul returns to regularly, and it's a, uh, particularly the Jew-Gentile, uh, the healing of that division is central to Paul's gospel and his teaching, and that's um, part of a broader concern that's expressed perhaps most clearly in Ephesians 2, uh, that um, Jesus uh, came to break down the dividing wall and form one new humanity, there again, it's Jew and Gentile, but it's still looking at the whole of the human race being reunited in Christ. And it, the question occurred to me, that and also thinking about 1 Corinthians and other writings of Paul, it occurred to me that uh, uh, the church, many churches today would warrant similar kind of rebuke from the apostles for their sectarianism and their uh, host hostility to, to other, other Christians and other Christian churches. I was a student of Avery Colonel Dulles and then also Joe Leonhardt and John Woodbridge, all of whom I know were on the Evangelicals and Catholics Together Dialogue. Could you give us a brief word on the current state of that dialogue? Yeah, I'm, I've been a part of it uh, for the last two cycles. It, the, um, uh, it's a group of evangelical Protestants and Roman Catholics, and the, uh, the goal has been to produce periodic statements some of them dealing with historic divisions between Protestants and Catholics, like um, issues about Mary, uh, doctrine of justification, that sort of thing. Some of them addressing cultural and social issues. Uh, the last statement, the first one that I was part of, uh, was the one we, we issued about a year and a half ago uh, that had to do with marriage, and particularly in the light of the same-sex marriage uh, debates that are going on in various churches. So uh, we're right now in the middle of a of another cycle. It's a two-year cycle to produce one of these uh, statements, and we're in the middle of one that's dealing with, um, uh, I guess you could say it's it's an effort to um, provide a kind of apologetic for the Christian faith, similar to the apologetic efforts of the early Christian apologists. They were de describing and defending what Christian what Christianity was to the uh, cultured or uncultured pagans of their time, and we're trying to come up with a statement that expresses that uh, it's our, uh, the premise is that there's a great deal of ignorance about what Christianity is, what kind of claims Jesus makes, uh, what kind of implications that has. Uh, so we're trying to summarize that so that, uh, um, you know, make a, make a clear statement of Christian faith to those who don't, don't know uh, much about Christianity. Sir, early in your book, The End of Protestantism, Pursuing Unity in a Fragmented Church, you write, uh, and I quote, my agenda will make Protestant churches more Catholic, but that is because it will make them more evangelical. The two go together because Catholicity is inherent in the gospel. Would you be willing to explain to us what is it that you mean by the terms Catholic and evangelical in this text? 
You know, let me start with the evangelical part. Uh, that I'm using it in an uh, etymological sense, really. Uh, evangelical is applied to a certain class of Protestants these days, but the word goes back to a Greek word that simply means the gospel or the good news, uh, the heralding of good news. And uh, when I when I talk about it in that in that passage, and uh, th that's part of a chapter where I'm talking about the uh, uh, the uh, evangelical unity, and uh, I'm talking about the the character of the gospel and the fact that the gospel is about the salvation of humanity, but part of the salvation of humanity is the reunion of the fragmented human race that uh, arose in the aftermath of Babel. And you can trace that, um, uh, it's, you can trace it back to the, the beginning of Israel's history with the call of Abraham. That comes in the immediate aftermath of the collapse of the nations at Babel and the, the scattering of the nations, their division of language and uh, I think a division of religion that occurred at Babel. And then God calls Abraham as the solution to that, to that scattering of humanity. Uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the, so the, from the beginning, Israel exists in order to be God's agent to bring the nations back to God uh, and to bring the nations together under the blessing of God. Uh, and that's what, uh, you know, Jesus I mentioned uh, earlier, the uh, passage in Ephesians 2, Jesus died in order to reunite the human race as one new man. Uh, you have uh, the Pentecost, the Spirit's work is to reverse what happened to Babel. Uh, um, the Pentecost account in Acts 2 has uh, resonates with the account of Babel, but it's a reversal of that. You have a language miracle, but instead of being a language miracle that divides, it's a language miracle that that uh, allows everyone in from every nation under heaven, Acts 2 says, to hear the gospel in his own language. So that's what I mean by gospel is that there's, uh, I'm talking about the the good news of Jesus Christ, but with the emphasis on the fact that there's a um, uh, God's intention is to unify humanity, and that's part of the good news. Part of the damage of sin is that the um, human human race is divided, and in healing that damage, God is bringing human humanity back together. That's what the church is. It's the present form of that new new humanity. Uh, the, the word Catholic there, in, in in some ways, there's there's a, uh, a something of a ambivalence or double meaning in the word Catholic. Catholic means um, universal. Um, and I, th I think it's helpful to break that down a, a little bit to make sense of it. To say that the church is Catholic means that the church is uh, one church spread out throughout all space. Uh, every Christian who's living today is part of the same, uh, the same body, uh, the same communion, in spite of our uh, are genuinely tragic divisions that there's still a, there still is a unity that's there uh, that is uh, a unity in Christ and the Spirit uh, and to be a Catholic is to recognize that in the, our particular time uh, all Christians everyone who names the name of Christ everyone who walks with Christ is a brother or sister in Christ but there's also Catholicity in time uh, it's one church from uh, you could say from Pentecost you can go back to Abraham. You can go even further back and say, as some medieval theologians did, that the church begins with Abel. Uh, but that's that's one entity, that's one church that's uh, running through that history. And so that's all our heritage. Uh, Protestants sometimes have a tendency to uh, lop off uh, a thousand years of church history and treat it as somebody else's history. Uh, everything from maybe Constantine up through the, the Reformation or maybe from around 500 to the Reformation, that's all. That's Roman Catholic history, but it's not our history. Uh, but if we're Catholics, then we recognize that that's our history, too. Um, so uh, those are a couple of the dimensions of Catholicity. And so when I say that the, uh, the to be evangelical is to be Catholic, I mean, to be evangelical is to recognize uh, that the unity and the universality of the church, both in space and time. And the argument is that that's inherent in the gospel that we that we proclaim about Jesus. Thank you for that explanation. If I may quote you again, you write, and this is on uh, pages 18 and 19, it is essential to correctly understand the factuality of the church's unity. The unity of the church is not an invisible reality that renders visible things irrelevant. It is a future reality that gives present actions their orientation and meaning. Um, and I just think that's a, a beautiful expression of, uh, of what church unity is. Help us understand 
can church unity be defined by institutional structure, sacramental practice, or by doctrinal confession? Why or why not? Well, let me start by explaining a little bit more about the passage that you quoted. Uh, what I'm opposing there is a kind of complacency that some Christians have about uh, the uh, current divisions that exist within the church. Uh, I think it is true that there's a, a certain kind of unity that we already possess, but I don't think that that's a unity that is uh, that uh, really expresses the gospel that we preach. I mean, you could say um, Peter could have responded to Paul, well, sure, I'm not eating with Gentiles, but I'm sp still invisibly spiritually united with Gentiles. I don't think Paul would have been, I don't think Paul would have been, um, he would not have found that convincing. Uh, there's a, there is a visible expression of the unity that I think is, uh, is essential if the church is, if the church is healthy. Um, but that, uh, in answer to the specific question you asked, I think all of those dimensions that you mentioned are uh, aspects of what unity is. Uh, and they're all uh, uh, dimensions of uh, the church that, uh, where there's uh, more or less profound disunity uh, in, our current, in our current situation. Uh, you think of uh, doctrinal uh, unity. There's a certain degree of doctrinal unity. You can say that many churches uh, confess the Nicene Creed or the early creeds of the church, Protestants and Catholics and Orthodox and others. But then, of course, you have a large segment of the church that doesn't acknowledge any creed. Uh, what do you do about them? Uh, and then there's been elaborations of the gospel in the midst of disputes, interdenominational inter disputes. Uh, Protestants weren't content just to uh, reaffirm Nicaea. They uh, constructed confessions that cl clarified where they were uh, differing from Roman Catholics and then eventually differing from one another. So you have this, these doctrinal elaborations that um, uh, express a different different versions of the gospel in some ways. Um, there's, there, you might be able to isolate some, some degree of unity, but they're pretty profound differences. Uh, so I think a unified church would have to have some kind of doctrinal dimension to it. It would have to have some kind of unified confession of what the gospel is and what the implications are, uh, both uh, uh, doctrinally and practically. Um, the, the, there'd have to be a sacramental dimension to uh, unity. Um, uh, there's... Uh, Christian churches practice baptism and the Lord's Supper. Other, some churches uh, label other rites and ceremonies as sacraments. So there's a difference on even how to count the sacraments. And even on the sacraments where we, that we share, uh, there are differences of practice. And I think one of the, it's not just a difference of theology that uh, should be a concern, but then uh, the difference of, um, differences of theology that lead to a failure to acknowledge uh, other churches practice as sacrament. So, you know, there's some some churches that won't acknowledge another church's baptism as a baptism. There are uh, churches that won't accept anyone at the Lord's table that's not part of their particular denomination that doesn't have a certain view of the Lord's Supper or isn't attached in some way to some governmental form. I'm thinking of Roman Catholicism. So there are, there are um, even w even where we have a certain degree of unity, there's uh, uh, there's uh, there's both practical and doctrinal theological divisions. So I think uh, unity has to include uh, the pursuit of um, w you know one mind, one voice, one lip, confessing Jesus and the gospel together, uh, and that has to be expressed in visible ways. Uh, and I think uh, sacramental uh, uh, sacramental particularly is a that's a kind of the the uh, one of the chief visible manifestations of the unity that we have. Thank you for that response. If I can quote your text one more time, um, and this is on pages 37 and 38, you write this. If Protestants were to become Catholics, parenthesis not Roman, churches that once identified with one or the other variety of Protestantism would cease to identify themselves in this way. Reunion would also be the end of Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy, despite claims to the contrary. Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy, as much as Protestantism, are defined by their differences from one another and from other parts of the Church. In your view, can individual denominational traditions offer trusted guidance for worship and doctrine, or does this Reformed Catholicism project that we're speaking of, does it require churches to shed their specific and particular de denominational histories? Thank you. <laughs> 
Well, I think I would, I, I have to refine, uh, the answer would have to be uh, yes and no. Uh, I think there are some uh, traditions of liturgical uh, life uh, that are, some are more reliable than others. Uh, some traditions of doctrinal reflection are more reliable than others. I'm obviously saying that from a particular position and from a particular set of convictions. Um, but um, I, so I, I would I would want to break that down into specific more specifics in order to answer answer it fully. Um, but I, I do think that the, the I think the general uh, a, a general way to approach it or a general answer to the question would be that um, Christians need to enter into um, uh, an effort to uh, an effort to unify the church with the readiness to give up things that are dear and near and dear to their hearts for the sake of the unity of the church. I don't think that that's, I, I'm not advocating a kind of lowest common denominator. I'm not advocating uh, ignoring history. I can't ignore history. We start from where we are. Uh, you can't ignore doctrinal differences. Uh, we have to, we have to work through those and unity has to be on the other side of those doctrinal debates and disputes. Um, but, uh, if if uh, everyone enters uh, that kind of dialogue with the uh, insistence that our side is going to win no matter what, that what we're here to do is simply to tell everyone else what is right and everyone's going to just have to listen to us, then I think that's a non-starter. Everyone has to be ready to um, give up, has to be ready to die to who they are and uh, for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the unity of the church. Um, so I think... So the the general answer would be a more more of a stance and a and a uh, um, a personal attitude, and then when you get into specific, you'd have to get into specifics to answer the question more fully. We often speak of primary issues and secondary issues; those of which are uh, those issues which are absolutely essential and we can't give them up, and those which are secondary, which we can give them up. How do we determine between that which is core to our Christian identity and must be preserved, and that which is secondary and which can be uh, given up for the sake of, of greater unity in the church. Yeah. Well, I do believe that there are primary and secondary concerns. I think that that's a valid distinction. I, I don't think, though, that we can uh, decide ahead of time what those what those things are. Um, and I think those, uh, uh, like much of much, much of what um, I mean, much of the church's life, much of our personal lives. Uh, Things are discovered on the way. Um, you know, I think of my experience as a parent. Um, I had a theory about how parenting would go when I started, uh, and um, I still pursue some of the things that I started with. But uh, parenting for thirty some years has modified the way I parent uh, naturally. So, because the things that you discover uh, as you uh, on the way of uh, you know in the process. Um, the proverb says that um, the way of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter to the full light of day. Uh, it doesn't; the sun doesn't come up all at once, and uh, there's a little light shed. But if we are walking in the way of obedience and faith, then we can be confident that the Lord is going to shine the light more brightly. So I think even the question, even a question like that, a question about what counts as essential and what doesn't, is something that should be a subject of continuing debate and discussion within the church along the way toward. Unity. I don't think we can decide ahead of time. Well, um, you know, this uh, this this list of things uh, is uh, uh, at least this list of my distinctive doctrinal practice doctrines or practices are things that are non-negotiable for me. Um, I think there are certain there are certain things that are non-negotiable for Christians in general, and we start from that premise. But then uh, there's uh, much of what much of what counts as secondary or primary, I think, is discovered along the way of discussion and dialogue and debate. And I, I think it would be helpful uh, to hear you state, what, what are those things that you would assume to be primary and core to Christianity that shouldn't be uh, uh, yeah. uh, up for negotiation? Yeah, right. The, I think that doctrinally, I, would, I think that you have to, uh, this is more a pragmatic judgment than one that uh, is, is uh, fully theologically elaborated. But I think in the circumstances, I think you have to start with something like the, the, early, the earliest of the, of the Catholic creeds, Nicaea. Uh, the the, the uh, dogmatic 
statements of the early councils, and I see in Chalcedon maybe, the dogmatic statements of the early councils on the Trinity and the person of Christ as a doctrinal foundation, uh, the practice of baptism and the Lord's Supper, uh, some degree, I'm, the, I'm running through the standard Protestant marks of the church, some degree of uh, conformity to Christian uh, morality and Christian truth and some uh, you know, some some sort of discipline. Those those features, I think, are would be non-negotiable. I think the the difficulty in finding a starting point is that um, the difficulty is you, you, I, I don't think it's it wouldn't be right to say okay we're taking as a premise the decisions of the Council of Trent, and that's the foundation that's the starting point for ecumenical dialogue. Um, um, that's a non-starter. Couldn't take the Westminster Confession. That's a non-starter. So again, it's kind of as a pragmatic thing. What are the uh, what are the what are the doctrinal foundations that were determined before the church, even between East and West, was divided? And I think uh, you know, we, we get to Chalcedon, you already have some some uh, difficulties with uh, certain parts of the church in the Far East and in the Coptic Christianity that never accepted uh, Chalcedon. So there's there's some challenges there already. But I think something like that is a doctrinal basis, uh, just as a as again as a pragmatic starting point. Very good. Dr. Lightheart, what are the real roadblocks today to ecumenical progress? Well, I think that uh, there are roadblocks on different ends. Uh, my book is primarily addressed to Protestants. I'm a Protestant. I'm a conservative Protestant. So the book is addressed to people like me um, trying to speak into my own world. Um, and it's I think that's a world where uh, interest in the unity of the church has not been strong uh, in, in a lot of, uh, uh, for the last, uh, I should say, for the last century or so, while the mainline churches have been uh, pursuing ecumenical efforts of various sorts, some some healthy and successful, some not so much, uh, some very damaging to the church. Um, but while that's been going on, a lot of the conservative churches, the evangelical churches, have uh, prioritized truth over unity and not been interested in pursuing unity of the church. The, ecumen the evangelical movement in some ways is kind of an ecumenical uh, ecumenical coalition of Christians, but there hasn't really been an effort to overcome denominational divisions. It's been a kind of uh, co-belligerency and coexistence within, within denominational, within the situation of denominational division. Um, so uh, my, uh, my book is aimed at, uh, and most of what I write on the subject is aimed at that world because that's the world that I'm in. And I think the uh, the uh, I think there are a couple of main obstacles there. One is there is a, a fair bit of sectarianism within uh, the evangelical conservative Protestant world. Um, it's not the kind of sectarianism that says um, only my denomination is right, but it is the kind of sectarianism that uh, tends to uh, divide, particularly from Roman Catholics and Orthodox. To, you know, there's a strong sentiment among evangelical Protestants and, and some evangelical Protestants that Catholics and Orthodox um, shouldn't even be considered Christian churches. Um, so there's a sectarian tendency within within evangelical Protestantism that's an obstacle. And maybe even more than that, uh, I think there's an, uh, an indifference to uh, the issue of unity. There's a, there's a comfort and complacency about our current, uh, the current state of the church that is, uh, uh, that's a, uh, I think that's a that's a big obstacle, and that's again that's part largely what I'm trying to address. And and in order to do that, I try to provide a a biblical grounding for uh, my appeals for unity. Um, that's the kind of that's you know by conviction. I think you have to have a biblical grounding for pursuing this, and it's also the the rhetorical appeal that will uh, that will uh, hit home with the people I'm I'm writing to. But uh, I haven't written as much about Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy. I don't. I'm not in those worlds. Uh, I'm, it'd be a little presumptuous of me, I think, to to address them and to tell them what they should be doing. But I do think that there are huge obstacles on that side to unity. I say that in uh, in the context, first of all, of tremendous um, concessions and uh, a tremendous shift within Roman Catholicism in the middle of the 20th century with Vatican, Vatican II and the aftermath of Vatican II. Uh, genuine openness to Protestant insight, genuine openness to dialogue with Protestants, and, and I think a, um, a pretty profound 
and profoundly moving uh, willingness to, uh, to to die for the sake of the brothers, for the sake of the unity of the church, that I think uh, Protestants have a lot to learn from. But even having said that, you know, there's some, uh, I think the, the, uh, the Roman Catholic claims about the papacy, I don't think are biblically grounded, and they're a huge obstacle to union, not only with Protestants, but with Orthodoxy. Um, the um, the uh, uh, dogmatic uh, dogmatic uh, decrees about the uh, about Mary uh, are a, a large obstacle to uh, our to uh, unity with Protestants. So I think that, uh, and it, it's hard to see how that unravels, how how, how that changes, um, because of the the convictions that Roman Catholics have about the uh, in, infallibility of uh, of the uh, of official of official church teaching, how how do you how do you reverse uh, a decision like Vatican I uh, that's considered a dogmatic decision that established the infallibility of the Pope under certain conditions and circumstances? How do you how do you uh, how do you reverse that without um, without ceasing to be Roman Catholic? So I have to say, if that is, uh, but how do you come to any kind of real profound unity of the church without some kind of modification, severe modification of that. So I think that's, that's a place that I think that's a uh, Roman Catholicism presents huge obstacles to unity and ones that I don't see any human way of overcoming. Mm. And that takes me to exactly my next question. Can you envision some sort of scenario whereby the church becomes visibly united in the next several decades? Well, uh, uh, let me start with a biblical answer to that question. Um, uh, one of the things that happens in the history of Israel, and of course, after after the reign of Solomon, the kingdom is divided into north and south. And for much of the history of the monarchy, uh, Israel and Judah were separate nations, different kings, different uh, sanctuaries, different practices of worship. Um, and uh, and yet uh, there's indications, particularly in the, in the book of Kings, that uh, show that the Lord continued to consider the Northern Kingdom, despite all its idolatry and sin, continued to consider them his covenant people. There's some pretty striking passages late in Kings, late, late in Second Kings, where the Lord has compassion on Israel for the sake of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's after uh, you've read chapter after chapter of you know Ahab setting up a temple of Baal and Jeroboam setting up golden calves at Dan and Bethel. And yet the Lord considers them as covenant people. But that's the history of the monarchy. But then when Israel and Judah go into exile, they go in uh, into exile, still divided. They come out of exile as one people. Uh, and that's Ezekiel prophesies that. Ezekiel talks about the stick of Judah and the stick of Israel being bound together, tied together while Israel is in exile. So that's a that's a process that uh, takes uh, uh, 70 or 100 years You know, over the course of a couple of lifetimes, several generations, a couple of generations, uh, uh, the Lord does some, uh, well, takes, takes Israel and Judah through a crucible. Okay. So that it's, it's exile. It's a, it's a demolition of both kingdoms. <laughs> that's, that's what brings them together. But it's in, in terms of time frame, it's pretty short. Um, so, um, I, I say that just to, um, I'm not predicting anything. I just say that, uh, to uh, make it clear that, uh, Scripturally speaking, there's uh, there's nothing that would prevent God from acting rapidly to uh, to to uh, break down uh, divisions and to reunify in more profound ways than we than we currently have. Um, and I see signs that uh, there are things things happening. That's part of the book is the the uh, 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 trying to analyze the current situation of denominationalism. And there've been it's hard it's hard to predict where denominational Christianity goes because it's been so flexible over, particularly in America, over several centuries, and it's a it's a very adaptable system, um, and has some virtues to it, as I try to show in the book. Um, but I do think that it's ultimately an obstacle to uh, the unity that Jesus wants for His church. Um, so, but it, there there do seem to be signs that there are weakening denominational ties. Um, when I speak on these topics, um, almost inevitably. I hear from people in the audience who say, well, in our city, this is what's happening. And the churches are working together in these particular ways and um, churches across denominational lines. Um, there's been a, I think the, uh, the kind of culture war situation has led to 
much closer ties between Catholics and Protestants than existed uh, 50 or 100 years ago. Uh, and that's that's similar to what Ezekiel's talking about. It's through the fires of uh, exile and through the fires of uh, certain kinds of uh, cultural pressure that uh, that Christians are finding more in common with each other than they realized. Dr. Lightheart, what does the rise of global Christianity mean for the future of the Christian ecumenical movement? Well, I think it's uh, it's a complicating factor in one respect uh, because um, much of the uh, much of global Christianity doesn't fit into the, um, the the European and American categories of Christianity. Um, uh, the instinct among Europeans and Americans is to think primarily in terms of three large families of churches, uh, one large fam- family of churches, Protestants, and then you've got uh, Catholics and then the, the less unified but, but still recognizably unified world of orthodoxy. Uh, but a lot of the churches in Africa, uh, for example, are churches that have some kind of connection with missionary movements from the, from Europe or the United States. But the real growth and the real impetus behind them is post-missionary. So the missionaries leave and suddenly you have these movements pop up and you have a, a, a leader, uh, somebody who's trained within an Anglican church, for example, uh, but he doesn't remain Anglican. He becomes a prophet <laughs> and he starts uh, preaching uh, and starts a huge movement. And there's a, you know, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, ends up, you have millions of people in Africa that are fo- followers of this particular movement. That, that kind of thing happens. You get charismatics would be another, charismatic and Pentecostal would be another large category, but that's a very diverse one. Um, and it's, again, it doesn't have obvious connections with uh, Western uh, Western Christianity. So in one sense, it, it hugely complica- complicates because you don't have, you can't just think in terms of uh, Protestant Catholic Orthodox. At the same time, I think that there are, um, there are, there are uh, factor or there are forces in that, uh, in global Christianity. I think there are forces within Pentecostalism that uh, ha- uh, can, they contain an impulse toward, toward unity. Uh, they ha- contain an impulse toward, uh, because they aren't in recognizable historic denomination denominations, that means that there's an openness to um, to other Christians that might not exist if they were if they were more rigidly part of a denominational tradition. So I think there's there are opportunities there, but um, certainly it hugely complicates uh, uh, the the Christian world in in all kinds of daunting but very exciting ways. Dr. Lightheart, if I can ask a final question, it's a question that I've been asking all of the interviewees on this program, and that is this. What would it mean for the church today to be united? How could we recognize this unity, and what is it that individual Christians can do in order to pursue the real unity of the church? Thank you. The, uh, the Going back to an earlier set of comments, um, I think the unity of the church is expressed in uh, several different areas. A unified church would be a church that has... Uh, uh, is unified in teaching and doctrine, and I think uh, also I didn't mention this as much in my uh, in my previous discussion, but I think it's important that uh, a unified church has has to have some form of doctrinal discipline. That's one of the huge problems of the current situation. You have churches that are uh, dividing and struggling over uh, over uh, 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 sexual issues, sexuality issues, for example. Uh, they have there are mechanisms within those individual churches to deal with those conflicts and to try to resolve them uh, in the in the Presbyterian Church in the United States in Presbyterian Church USA for example there's a, there are there's a governmental system to resolve that there is no such even ad hoc system to resolve lo- uh, on a global scale uh, we, there there's just isn't a way to uh, determine what uh, what counts as you know what is outside the bounds of Christian teaching on sexuality and what isn't. Uh, you can do that within denominational system, within uh, individual denominations, but not globally. So I think a unified church would have to have, even if it's just an ad hoc, uh, which is what the early councils were, just some kind of ad hoc gathering of bishops in order to decide what they, what Arian, uh, decide, make a decision about Arianism and have some way of, uh, so, some way, even if, if it's imperfect, some way of enforcing that, those boundaries. So that would be part of the unity. Uh, unity would be involved recognition of um, uh, 
intercommunion of churches uh, at the Lord's table and recognition of the Eucharists of other churches as genuine Eucharists and the baptisms of other churches as genuine baptisms. Uh, to your last question, what can what can Christians do? I think there uh, depends on the opportunities depend on where you are and what kind of responsibility you have in the Christian church. But every Christian can pray, and I think the that uh, is the central um, uh, that's the central action that we can take. Uh, we don't uh, uh, we can join in Jesus' prayer that His disciples would be one as the Father is one with the Son. We know that Jesus is going to get what he asks of his father, and we should join our prayers to that. Uh, unity is not something that we can manufacture. It's not something we can manipulate and, and control, and um, we get into huge problems if it's something we're trying to uh, create on our own energy with our own ingenuity. Uh, it has to be a gift from God, but it's something we should ask. If if we, we have not because we ask not, if we want a unified church, then we should ask the father to... Uh, bring his children into one family. It's been our delight today to be speaking with Dr. Peter J. Lightheart, president of Theopolis Institute in Birmingham, Alabama, senior fellow of theology and literature at New St. Andrews College, and also author of the text that we've been discussing, The End of Protestantism, Pursuing Unity in a Fragmented Church. Dr. Lightheart, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Jonathan. It's been delightful.